Let's take a look at how to write a hypothesis. So there's a rubric for the IB Physics Internal Assessment, the IA. And one of the aspects of the rubric in the exploration section is that you have appropriate background. And there's something similar in the MYP rubric for the planning investigation. The type of investigation that I'm talking about, the most common type, would be where you're isolating variables and you're trying to see how an independent variable affects a dependent variable. And your hypothesis is just going to be a prediction as to the features and the shape of this graph. So maybe you predict that the dependent variable is going to increase rapidly at first, but then as the independent variable gets bigger, it's not going to increase so rapidly. So you've got a prediction graph there. And what's usually difficult for students to come up with is reasoning for the chosen shape and features. And that's really what this video is going to be about. It's going to teach you some approaches that you can take to help you come up with some good reasoning for your prediction graph. And that doesn't mean you're going to be correct, but that's not the purpose of a hypothesis. The purpose of a hypothesis is to make an educated guess as to what's going to happen. One of the most common mistakes I see in a hypothesis is a student will predict that, say, the dependent variable is going to increase when the independent variable increases. And in all cases, that's just not enough. Let me give you an example of why that's not enough. Let's say we we're going to do an experiment. We've got a ramp. We're going to roll a marble down to the bottom of the ramp. We're going to time how much time it takes. We're also going to measure the distance that it goes down the ramp. So this distance here would be our independent variable. We're going to change that distance. And the time here would be our dependent variable. That's the one we're going to measure. Now if we simply say that we think the time will increase when the distance increases, it's an irrelevant experiment. Because if I go ask an eight-year-old if they think the time will increase when the distance increases, they will just say the same thing. They will say the time will increase with the distance. Everybody knows that, so it's not a worthwhile experiment. However, if you can predict the shape of that graph, dependent variable, independent variable, let's say even a proportional relationship. You think it's going to be proportional. When you double the distance, you're going to double the time. Then you've got something to compare it to. And that's going to give you a much more interesting to things to say in your evaluation section. So predicting a shape to your graph is very important. So let's start off with a simple example. In this case, we're going to see how extreme and known points can be used as reasoning to predict a graph for the experiment that we were just talking about, that simple experiment where we were changing the distance that a marble went down a ramp and then measuring the time it took. So we want to predict what's that graph of distance versus time going to look like. So when I say extreme points here, what I mean is imagine that your independent variable has a very small value. The smallest value would, of course, be 0 or a very large value. So let's start with the small value. Of course, if d is 0, then t is going to be 0, which gives us really a, a known point there. We know our curve has to pass through the origin. There's no doubt about that. Now, we don't get a lot if we go to large distances. We just kind of know right now that if we have a large distance, it's going to take more time. So I'm just going to put some other point up here to represent some distance in the corresponding time. So the real question that we want to get at is we imagine it's going to be a smooth curve between the two. Now is that smooth curve going to be like a proportional relationship? Or is it going to increase quickly at first and then slowly? Or increase slowly at first 
and then quickly. So we're really trying to choose between those three options. So what we do is we imagine a small increase, let's say a 10 centimeter increase. So we're going to increase from 0 to 10 centimeters or 0.1 meter. And we can imagine this is a large distance. Uh, I'm just going to make up a value here, say 5 meters, and then we're going to increase that by that 10 centimeters again, or 0.5 meters. So this would be 5.1 meter. And then we want to kind of think about how that's going to change the time. Well, we know if we've got like a short distance, like 10 centimeters, the marble's not moving very fast. But if we've got a long distance, then our average speed is much, much greater. And our speed at the bottom of the ramp is much, much greater still. So if something's moving slowly, it takes more time, right? So if we're moving slowly here, I shouldn't, I should expect a fairly large increase in time. Whereas here, it's moving really, really quickly. So to go that extra 10 centimeters is going to take almost zero time at all. We're expecting hardly any increase here, but we're increasing quite a bit here, right? 10 centimeters takes quite a bit longer here. 10 centimeters here, it's moving much more quickly. It's not going to take much longer at all. So we're going to start off with a steep slope, end up with a flat slope. So it's this curve here that would be our prediction. So I've explained the reasoning. Let's kind of go through how you'd write it in words. So we started with the idea that if we had zero distance, it's got to take zero time. And that means that the origin's got to be a point. Second, we had a very simple statement. If we had a larger distance, it has to take more time. So we've got to have a generally positive slope. So I just put a point up here somewhere. Then I compared a 10 centimeter increase at short distances. So I went from d equal to 0 to d equal to 10 centimeters. And I compared that to the same increase at 5 meters. My reasoning was that the marble would be moving much more slowly at short distances. And that means that we've got to get a much larger time increase at short distances than at long distances. That is to say, the slope must be larger for the small distances than for the large distances. So we had a steep slope, we had a shallow st slope, and we joined them in a continuous smooth curve. Now in that first experiment we did, we could have looked up a formula and made a mathematical prediction as to what the graph should look like. But in a lot of experiments you can't do that. So here's kind of a, a silly example. Let's say we've got these long rolls of linoleum. Linoleum, it's kind of plastic stuff that you put down on your floors. And what we're going to do is put rest the uh, linoleum on two supports. So this is just two supports. And we're going to measure the distance between those two supports. That's going to be our independent variable. So we're going to change that. Our dependent variable, what we're going to do is kind of wrap a, wrap a loop around the center of the uh, linoleum. And then we're going to hang a, a big weight. And we're going to keep increasing that weight until the weight hits the ground here. So our dependent variable is going to be that weight that brings, well, the weight again, the weight that brings the weight to the floor. So once again, we want to think about extreme values. So if we had d equal to 0, the smallest distance that we could have, it would be impossible to reach the floor. In other words, we're going to get an asymptote here. It's got to run along the axis so that when d equal to 0, we'd get an infinite weight. And then if we made d really, really large, eventually the weight of the linoleum itself is going to bring the linoleum down to the floor. In other words, you're not going to put, have to put any extra weight on that, and it'll hit the floor. So there's going to be some kind of a, a d max here at which no weight is needed. 
Now all you've got to do is connect those with a smooth curve and the only smooth curve that's going to work is going to be like that. So now all you have to do is put that reasoning into words but that's what your prediction graph is likely going to be. Now in most of the physics experiments that you do your prediction graphs are going to be one of these five types. Now there are other types or combinations of these types that could occur but generally you're going to see proportional relationships which means a straight line through the origin double one quantity you double the other triple one quantity triple the other linear increasing or decreasing so we might have a decreasing linear or an increasing linear if you are doing something like looking at plant growth with amount of sunlight we'd be expecting that there would be a certain ideal amount of sunlight where you get maximum plant growth and then it would dip off if you use too much sunlight or not enough sunlight. Sometimes your dependent variable will increase slowly at first and then quickly. Could be an increasing case or could be a decreasing case. And in other cases the dependent variable increases quickly at first but then slowly. And that could be an increasing case or a decreasing case. So for the most part, for most of the experiments that you do, you're really just trying to distinguish between these different types here. So we've done two examples where we used physical reasoning to make a prediction graph. You're probably more familiar with using a formula to make a prediction graph. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but there's some tricks to really making sense of a formula. So let's take a, a simple example, so one that you've probably seen. The period of a pendulum is given by 2 pi times the square root of the length of the pendulum divided by the acceleration due to gravity. Now 2 pi and g here are all constants, so I'm going to write this as 2 pi all over the square root of g times the square root of l. So now I've got this here is my say what my y variable my y variable equals a constant times the square root so that allows me to make a prediction here right away that that when I do my graph t should go as the square root of l in fact I can take that a little bit farther cuz if I were to do a graph of t versus the square root of l then I've got this 2 pi over square root of g times square root of l this here is my y variable 2 pi over g is a constant and the square root of l that's that's going to be my x variable I'm just going to call that x so if I plot t versus the square root of l it should have this form here which is a straight line a proportional relationship between y and x so I should get a straight line and even better the slope of that line should be equal to this constant which is equal to 2 pi over g over the square root of g so I can really do a good job of verifying that original equation now we can take this a little bit farther. Now we can take this a little bit farther because we, we should notice that in that formula there's no mass or angle. So mass and angle don't affect the period. If we were to do graphs of mass versus period and angle versus period, we should get straight horizontal lines. No matter what the mass is, we get the same period. No matter what the angle of release is, we get the same period. So these would be considered independent. And we can take this still a little bit farther because if you read a little more about the formula, you'll find it's a small angle approximation. It only works if theta's below about 15 or 20 degrees.
So if we want to verify this equation, we should keep our angle less than 15 degrees. And that comes in handy as well, because if you let it go back and forth, say, 10 times, there's going to be some energy lost in the amplitude. The angle is going to get smaller and smaller. But as long as the original angle was less than 15 degrees, it's not going to have an effect on the period. And if we look in a little more detail at the equation, it will say that there is a fixed point of support refer to that as POS and the length L is defined as the distance from that fixed point of support to the point mass but of course when we do a real experiment we don't use point masses which means in our experiment we should make the distance to the center of mass. So it's not just the length of the string. If you just measure the length of the string, it's going to be a little bit shorter, and you're going to get a systematic error. Also note that if it's not a fixed point, that's going to change the period. If you're holding the pendulum in your hand, and your hand is moving a bit, then you don't have a fixed point of support. So when we look at an equation, it's very important that we be able to sort out all these, uh, these details about the equation. And they're going to become very important in our analysis. So let's summarize the big ideas from the video. What we wanted from a hypothesis was a prediction graph with reasoning. And that reasoning might be physical reasoning or it might be kind of from a formula or some combination of the two. Now for your physical reasoning, of course some of that might just come from your knowledge of physics. But we had a few extra tricks that we could use such as extreme points. That's where you consider a very very small, perhaps a zero value for the independent variable and a very large value. Small, perhaps zero, and large, perhaps infinite. You want to consider if there might be critical points, usually meaning a maximum or a minimum. You want to consider if there are known points, so perhaps 100 degrees Celsius will be a known point because you know it boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Look as well where there might be asymptotes. Consider that idea. You're basically going to assume that you've got to get a smooth curve. That'll be true in almost all cases. And we had this little trick for telling us the shape of that smooth curve. And that was to consider what happens when you make small changes at the extreme values. So we'd be looking at the effects on the dependent variable when small changes made to the independent variable at the extreme values or perhaps just at two different points. So that allowed us to kind of say, OK, we've got two points. I know it's changing quickly at first, but not changing so quickly over here. So when I connect with the smooth curve, it's going to do something like that. When you're looking at formulas, you want to be precise about all the variables in that formula. So length was measured from where to where exactly. Analyze if there's any assumptions to that formula, such as does it only work for small angles. Look for missing variables, it, because that indicates, of course, independence.
between the two variables. And finally, write the equation in the form y equals a constant times some x variable. And this will tell you both the shape of the curve and what you need to do to linearize. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.